Great. All right, excellent, everyone. Uh, so our next speaker here is Dr. David Reitze. Uh, Dr. David Reitze holds joint positions as the executive director of the LIGO Laboratory and Research and a research professor at the California Institute of Technology. He obtained a PhD in physics from the University of Texas at Austin in 1990 and spent more than 20 years as a professor of physics at the University of Florida. Uh, his research interests uh, focus on the development of ultra-sensitive gravitational wave detectors and just general gravitational wave astronomy. Wrights, he was elected a fellow of the American Physical Society, the US Optical Society, and the American Association of the Advancement of Science. He was also awarded the National Academy of Sciences Award for a scientific discovery in 2017 uh, for his leadership role in LIGO. He is a member and former spokesperson of the LIGO Scientific Collaboration that received numerous awards for the first direct detection of gravitational waves in 2015, including the Special Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics, the Gruber Prize for Cosmology, and the American Astronomical Society Bruno Rossi Prize. Uh, he serves on numerous advisory committees from the international physics and astronomy communities, and we are so grateful and honored to have Dr. David Reitze here with us today. Uh, to talk about a field that is so exciting and someone from the collaboration um, itself. So without further ado, thank you so much, Dr. Reitze, and we'll turn it over to you. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's a, it's a delight to be here, even though we can't be doing this in person. I'm delighted to be able to talk to you from uh, Pasadena, California. So let me make sure that I am projecting my screen. Can you see it? Yes? Great. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I, I've been asked to talk a little bit about gravitational waves, uh, uh, what they reveal about the universe and, and how we detect them. So for the next 40, 45 minutes, that's what I will try and do. Um, and I'll start at the beginning. And the beginning goes back about 100 years uh, with uh, Albert Einstein and the general theory of relativity, which is a really mathematically complex and elegant theory that Einstein came up with that basically explains gravity. It is the working theory in physics of gravity. Quite complex, makes lots of different predictions. Uh, it's sort of best summarized in a phrase that was coined by John Wheeler, uh, another very eminent physicist, which says that basically space tells matter how to move, matter tells space how to curve. What does that mean? It means that I can think of two things. I can think of space, and Einstein also lumps time in that. There's space time. And there's stuff, matter, energy. Uh, and when I put stuff into space, uh, space changes shape. In other words, the geometry of space goes from something called Euclidean or uh, uh, Cartesian, if you will, in two dimensions to uh, uh, actually more complex kinds of geometries. And it actually warps the space, it curves the space. So one of the predictions, it took Einstein a while to actually get to the point where he believed it, was the prediction that as objects accelerate, as mass accelerates, they produce ripples in space time. In other words, the geometry is dynamic. So any accelerating mass, uh, any object, uh, you wave your hand, you stop your uh, car at a stoplight, you drop an apple, it produces a gravitational wave. Um, the problem is the size of the, the, the phenomenon the amplitude of these waves is exceedingly tiny. So, so I'll go into a little bit more detail in the coming slides, but basically we like to think of these in terms of astrophysical objects that you really need two big massive things colliding. In this case, uh, it's black holes. So this little cartoon that I'm gonna show you here is sort of a very, uh, it's not really accurately physically, but it gives you the sense of, of, of what a gravitational wave is. As, as you have two objects, these are massive black holes, maybe about 10 times the mass of the sun, orbiting around one another. They're actually radiating gravitational waves. So that's that ripple that you see going across the geometric pond there. Uh, and as they collide, all right, they stop, they stop rip, rippling. The reason their orbit is decaying is because they're actually inter, you know, producing these gravitational waves, and that's sucking energy out of the system. Right. Physically, um, it's a it's a bit more easy to understand them if you look at this sort of geometry. And I, if you stare at it too long, you'll actually start to get cross-eyed or tired. So you might want to blink every now and then. But basically, a gravitational wave, if it were coming at the presentation out of the presentation board to you, 
what it would be doing is it would be stretching space in one direction and at the same time compressing space. And what does that mean? It means literally that if I were to measure the distance between two points, those distances would be changes as a gravitational wave passes. And there are two polarizations of gravitational waves, much like light, uh, you're familiar with in uh, you know, astronomy. So um, physically though, there are strains. What is a strain? It's a change in length per unit length. So let me give you an illustration. So I can put an arbitrary coordinate system uh, down and um, so look at that left plot there and as um, the x arm contracts that arrow sort of traces the the total movement of the of the the point as the gravitational wave stretches space there all right if i'm close to that uh crossing point the origin of that uh coordinate system you don't get much motion but if i go further away you get a lot more motion. So, so this is basically the idea behind detecting gravitational waves is you wanna basically make a measurement over a, as long a baseline as possible. So that's, that's the L in that uh, um, uh, expression, delta L over L. Delta L is the change in distance that you're measuring over L the distance. Okay, all right. So that's basically what, what we're trying to do here. Now for those two black hole cartoon, the cartoon that I just showed you, uh, you can calculate what it is for black holes that are basically 10 times the mass of the sun. Uh, and there are hundreds of millions of light years away, roughly. Uh, the delta L over L that we're trying to measure is 10 to the minus 21 or, or 0.20 zeros with a one at the end of it. So, so these are really, really, really feeble phenomena. And it's actually deeply related to the fact that gravity is a very, very weak force. Um, okay, so, so, all right, they're hard to detect. Einstein predict them, predicted them, uh, you know, maybe back in 1937. Uh, it's taken us a long time to get to, to get there and try and actually make these detections. But why do we do it? Why do we spend the time to do it? He actually thought they would not be detected. He did not think you could build uh, devices that could detect them. Well, the reason a lot of people have spent a lot of time on this over the past 50 years is because they're really a new way to look at uh, the universe. So it's Detecting gravitational waves proves once again that Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity is right. That's all well and good. But really, they tell us things about the universe that other probes of the universe, such as photons that you measure in telescopes or neutrinos or subatomic particle collisions that you measure in particle colliders, can't give you that access to that information. So they're really completely new and unique probes of the cosmos. Um, they're detectable gravitational waves. The ones that we can detect on Earth are produced by really some of the most violent astrophysical events uh, in the universe. When two black holes collide, uh, it's actually quite, there's a huge amount of energy that's released. Um, they travel unimpeded through matter. Again, it has to do with the nature of gravity. It's a very weak force. It couples weakly to matter. So, so we don't have to worry about dust you know, in, in, in space. We don't have to worry about uh, uh, planets or stars or galaxies blocking, uh, blocking gravitational waves. They just go right, right through it. Uh, they travel at the speed of light. We've actually proved that uh, by measuring, uh, um, doing a measurement. And they carry direct information about basically the relativistic motion of bulk matter. And that's, what, that's really what you get out of gravitational waves. All right, so, so um, how do we do it? Well, we make devices called interferometers. Um, focus on the left picture for a minute. That is a, a, a very uh, simple schematic of something called a Michelson interferometer. The cylinder is going to be a source of light. In this case, it's a very pure source of light, a laser source. Uh, in the center of that sort of cross um, is something called a beam splitter. It takes the laser light, it splits it in two. Uh, the two sort of dark things that you see in the upper right and upper left are mirrors. They reflect the light back. The light comes back the same way it went out. It hits the beam splitter and it recombines. And depending on the relative lengths of the X and Y, the two arms, the two perpendicular arms, the light can either go back towards the laser or it can go towards that square, which uh, is basically a light collector. Uh, so, so here's a cartoon of how that works. So, so the laser light goes out. We're gonna color code the waves of the laser light uh, in two different colors. The one going down the parallel arm, we'll call it the X arm, bounces back um, and recombines, hits the beam splitter. And let me see if I can stop it. So I'll stop it right now. Um, and again, if we position the length of the arms, that's the distance between the beam splitter 
and one of the mirrors or the, and relatively the distance between the beam splitter and the other mirror, I'll call them the X and Y arm uh, length differences, the light will basically destructively interfere. Light is a wave, it, de destruct, it goes undergoes interference. It destructively interferes uh, uh, towards that plate that I, uh, I show you, and it comes back towards the laser, which we don't, we, we don't show. However, um, if a gravitational wave passes, uh, something a little bit different happens. So let me get the video going again. And as a gravitational wave passes, it's changing the distance between the beam splitter and the Y mirror and the beam splitter and the X mirror. So consequently, the, the amount of uh, distance that the light travels changes and that changes the interference pattern. Another way of saying is we measure the time of flight of the light as it goes through. And so what we're doing here is basically by dynamically reading out that change as a gravitational wave passes, um, we can record a gravitational wave. So you can think really of, of, of an interferometer as a, a transducer. It takes basically these waves that are fluctuations in space, as I just showed you, uh, reads them out using the time of flight of a laser down two different paths, and then turns it into basically um, you can think of that black square there with the light on it as a, you know, a, a photo detector, something you have in your, your iPhone or your, your, uh, your, your Google phone or something like that. And it just reads out the light and it records the signal and then it gets stored as voltage uh, somewhere. So that's the concept. Uh, in practice, it's of course a lot more complicated and we'll get into that in a minute. But, but the thing on the right uh, is basically the Hanford Observatory. Uh, and uh, you get a sense of scale there. I don't know how high that picture is taken from, but you can see uh, I've drawn what the arm lengths are. So, so in this case, the X and the Y arms, those two, the, where the end mirrors are, are four kilometers from the beam splitter. The beam splitter is located in that big building in the lower right-hand corner. Um, okay, so that four kilometers in this case is the L in that expression delta L over L that I showed you. So you can then say, okay, well, I remember you told me that uh, I need to measure 10 to the minus 21. You've told me what L is, it's four kilometers. So if you do some simple math, order of magnitude, uh, that requires a delta L measuring a displacement of about 10 to the minus 18 meters, all right? So, you know, again, 0 0.17 zeros and a one, all right? And to put that in perspective, that is a, take the diameter of a hydrogen atom, which is about one angstrom, all right, and divide that by 10 million. Alternatively, take the distance or take the diameter of a, a nucleus of an atom, a proton, for example, nucleus of a hydrogen atom, divide that by 10,000. So that's kind of the, the challenge that we're, uh, we're up against in uh, uh, trying to make gravitational wave detectors. I should point out since for the astronomers, you know, in, in, in astronomical optical astronomy, for example, uh, it's all about aperture, right? You make the biggest mirrors that you can possibly possibly make, like it's about light collection. Here, our equivalent in this case is the arm length. We, the, the longer the arms, the more sensitive our interferometer can be. So we actually made two of them. We have two of them. One is in uh, Louisiana. That's the one on the left. The one in Hanford you saw, that's a different perspective. They're about 3000 kilometers apart from one another. And there are very good reasons for making two of them. Uh, the first is really uh, has to do with the fact that these interferometers are on the earth. The earth is a very noisy place. Lots of things uh, shake, wiggle, change the, the characteristics of the uh, interferometer. And so we wanna make sure when we record, when we record a gravitational wave, it's a true gravitational wave and not some disruption that's local to one of the interferometers. So the signals we all, all look for are always coincidence. And, and by moving things far further away, um, you get that, you get, you know, independent interferometers. So you're making sort of independent measurements of the same wave as it passes through, through the earth. Uh, there's another reason that we have multiple interferometers, which I'll go into later. All right. So now um, this is probably the most technical uh, slide that I'm going to show. Um, what this tries to communicate is um, the kinds of physics that you need to understand in order to build a gravitational wave detector. So, so the plot on the right, a little bit complicated, but let's walk through it. Uh, on the x-axis is frequency. So this is frequency like the frequency of sound, the frequency of light. In this case, the frequency goes from about 10 Hertz to uh, about maybe five or six kilohertz, all right? So this is the sensitivity range of our detectors, all right? So if you will, this is the band, the collection bandwidth. And if you, you might recall that, that frequencies 
you know, that we can hear audible frequencies are about 20 Hertz to uh, a few kilohertz also. So it just so happens that the gravitational wave detectors that we build um, are, are in tune, if you will, with uh, our, the audio band, the human audio band. Uh, the y-axis is that quantity strain in, in somewhat funny u, uh, units, uh, but you get a sense of the, the magnitude of the, the measurement, 10 to the minus 22, 20, 23. Now those curves there are all calculated curves that we calculate before we actually build and design an interferometer, understand what its uh, uh, capabilities are. And each one of those curves represents a different noise source, or we call them noise, uh, that we have to understand and design either with or around or against to be able to build uh, a gravitational wave detector. The black curve is ultimately the curve that is the, is the curve we're trying to achieve when we make our detectors, right? And there, there are many different kinds of noises, but they sort of break down into three categories. The first are noises that basically change the, the, the length of the arm, all right? So the mirrors can get shaken. An easy one to understand there is, you know, if you live in a place where there's a lot of trucks and roads, or, or if you live in an earthquake zone, something like that, uh, the seismic events or, or anthropogenic events, man-made events can shake the mirrors. So you have to basically design a system that's robust against that. And the curve that you see, uh, in this case, it's the brown curve, is, is, is our design curve for how we actually minimize that noise in our interferometer. Then there's some really funky noises. There's quantum noise having to do with the fundamental nature of, of light. Uh, again, won't spend too much time on this, but basically light uh, is photons. You can think about it as waves or photons. The photons carry momentum and that momentum, when it when the photons hit the mirror, they impart that momentum to the mirror. Now a photon is a tiny, tiny thing and it has a little bit of momentum. But when there are lots of them, as we use in our interferometer, uh, it actually can move the mirror. And the fact is, is that those photons don't all arrive in perfect unanimity and perfect uh, sequence. They actually arrive a little bit randomly. That has to do with quantum mechanics. And then there's something called thermal noise. I'll explain a little bit what that is in the next slide here. Uh, the other kind of noises are sensing noises. Remember I told you that we measure the time of flight of the photon after it leaves or the waves after they leave the beam splitter. Uh, there's also noises that can corrupt there. Basically, it, you know, basically if, you're in, if there's any residual gas, if there are molecules, the light can scatter off the molecules, that changes the arrival time the physical phenomena that you would know is index of refraction. So we try and make the index of refraction one uh, in our detector. And then there's also uh, uh, a correlated quantum noise called um, uh, basically shot noise. And that has to do again, the, the photons when they arrive at the beam splitter and go to the detector, they arrive sort of at random times. And then there are also other hundreds of noise sources. So the ones we worry about all right, the ones that dominate our detector, we worry about all of them, but the ones that dominate our detector are those, those that are shown uh, in purple and in uh, red. And I, and I wanna give, and, and the frequency dependence of all of them is all calculated and pretty well understood. But I wanted to give you sort of a physical intuition of, of the, the thermal noise. So, so here is a picture of one of our advanced LIGO mirrors. It's about, um, that's about 38 centimeters in diameter. It's about 18 centimeters thick. Um, it's massive, it's 40 kilograms, um, and it looks beautiful, but it turns out that um, because it's at a finite temperature, listen to it, but it actually corrupts basically the light phase and that leads to a, a, a noise source. So, so there's, like I said, lots of those and, and we, we don't have time to walk through all of them, but I will sort of walk through the main pieces of the interferometer, uh, we call it a detector, uh, so you get the sense of it. So, so this is a more complex view, it's still a pretty simple view when you actually uh, consider it against the real detector. But it's a pretty simple view of, of what the interferometer looks like and in, uh, in terms of all sort of the complexity of it. So there's the laser. Um, the laser right now is about 50 watts. We're actually jacking it up to about 150 watts. Uh, uh, there's a picture of it. Um, you can see that it's actually a very, uh, it's actually the world's most stable laser. Uh, the people that work with it have to work in clean room garb. 
the, the laser power is high enough that it can actually damage mirrors if, they're, if there's dust on the mirrors. Uh, then there's a bunch of conditioning optics. Um, uh, basically the light out of a laser, even though it's very good, it's not good enough to actually put through the, um, uh, put into the detector to meet our requirements. So we have some conditioning. Uh, you see the beam splitter, you see the what we call the end test masses. Those are the, the, the end mirrors that are four kilometers away. There are other mirrors. And those other mirrors, actually, the input test masses, the what we call the signal and cy uh, power cycling cavity, actually serve to amplify the signal inside the interferometer by keeping the light in there a lot longer. Um, and then there we have to condition the light that comes out. Uh, and that goes through something called output mode cleaner, and then there are photo detectors. So this just walks you sort of through the key features. So this is one of the things we have to do is beat the ground motion, the seismic motion, the fact that cars are driving around. So, so we have these very complex, uh, actively controlled seismic isolation platforms. Um, these things are very, you know, really uh, uh, master classes in uh, engineering uh, that all of the optics sit on. Uh, then there's the optics themselves. Um, we talked about the mirror. The mirrors are actually suspended. The only contact that the mirror that actually reads out, the that sees the gravitational wave that the laser bounces off on, that's that bottom mirror. It has actually contact, it's contacting the rest of the world through four um, silica fibers. So these are basically homemade fibers. They're about 400 microns in diameter. So we actually suspend the, this 40 kilogram mass, this 40 kilogram mirror off of those fibers. And the reason we do that has to do with some of the noises that I talked about um, earlier. Uh, then there's the mirror themselves. Uh, that's a nice picture uh, uh, illuminating the mirror. Uh, even though the mirror, the mirror is not, you know, perfectly shiny like you might expect, a, you know, a mirror that's uh, doing optical astronomy because uh, in this case, it's tuned to one particular wavelength. In our case, that wavelength is infrared. It's uh, uh, about 1064 nanometers, so a little bit, a little bit outside the visible spectrum. So, and then we have to put it all in a vacuum system. Remember, I said molecules are bad. So, so we have the world's uh, one of the world's largest high vacuum systems. Um, so that's a picture of it under construction. Now it's all under uh, in those those arches over there. Uh, it's a massive vacuum system. Uh, um, it's got uh, 50 kilometers of, of welds. And I can tell you that building this vacuum system and maintaining it uh, is really a tour de force. And of course, we need two of them. So there's one at, one at each um, observatory. So, so, um, so that's sort of the, the components in, in the detector, the, the little bit of the physics behind the detector. Uh, if you put it all together, uh, this is actually what we measure. And this is a very nice, you recognize the same axes, uh, gravitational wave strain on Y, frequency on X. Obviously, and maybe I said this, maybe I didn't, but lower is better. Obviously, the lower that curve is, the, the more sensitive we are to gravitational waves. And you see there's some lines in it. Uh, those lines are pretty well understood. Um, so it's not perfect. It doesn't meet our modeling exactly. There's still some things we don't completely understand, particularly at low frequency, but it works and it works quite uh, quite well. So, so now let me shift into uh, gravitational wave uh, astrophysics. So um, let me start by coming back to this question of why do we build these big detectors and why we spent so much uh, time uh, and uh, intellectual energy on them. And the answer is because they can answer big questions. So, so one of the really first questions that one can ask, and it's probably one of the most challenging is, uh, where does ge general relativity break down? General relativity is a, a theory that has, it is the theory of gravity. It has stood the test of time an experiment for 100 years. Uh, might we see deviations from general relativity when we measure gravitational wave events? Perhaps. I, I would say it's unlikely, but you never know. Um, more interesting, and again, related also to general relativity, is what's the fundamental nature of a black hole? A black hole was, black holes are, are very simple objects. They're basically characterized by two things, the amount of mass that they can be, that they have inside them. In this case, it has, it's not mass, it's actually the curvature of space time and uh, whether they're, they have angular momentum, they're spinning. And black holes that just have mass and angular momentum, they're called ball, all right? But black, black holes may have other characteristics. They may be quantum in nature. There may be something beyond the event horizon where we can't see that would tell us that 
they're not exactly general relativistic black holes. They're something different. So that could be exciting if we could uh, see something in our gravitational waves that shows that. How does matter behave under extreme conditions? We'll say more about this in a few slides, but basically when uh, a certain kind of object, a neutron star, uh, which is uh, basically a, a remnant uh, of, of a supernova explosion, about 1.4, 1.5 solar masses left behind. Uh, and as the name implied, it's made up mostly of neutron stars. Um, they can also uh, form in binary systems and pair off with one another and they radiate gravitational waves and they can collide. And when they collide, they collide at relativistic speeds. Uh, so these are really super big particle colliders in, in, in the universe. They're at it, you know, sort of new, neutron smashers. Uh, so you can study how the matter behaves under these very extreme conditions when they're moving at fractions of the speed of light. Um, and there are different kinds of stars that have been uh, 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 neutron star types that have been predicted. None of them have been detected, but you know, we, we look for these different kinds of stars. Um, another fundamental question, which I'll shed some light on uh, uh, later in the talk, is where do heavy elements come from? Uh, we know they come from the Big Bang, hydrogen and a little bit of helium. We know they come from supernova explosions. Uh, most of the, the medium uh, um, you know, uh, atomic number of atomic uh, number elements. The heaviest ones, the lanthanides, uh, actinides, they come, we believe until very recently that they came from the collision of two neutron stars, but you need to actually see a collision of two neutron stars to, to verify that. So again, uh, that's a, we'll save a little bit more. How do stars explode? Uh, the physics of supernova is not completely well understood yet. There's lots that is understood and models are, are, are quite predictive, but there's a part of the, the explosion, basically the, the um, reestablishment of a, of a shock uh, wave to blow off all that material that you see that isn't well modeled. Could we find clues to dark matter and dark energy? Uh, dark matter has been known for, for almost 80 years now, uh, and it's still unknown as to composition. Uh, dark energy, much more recent, only about 20 years old. Uh, not much is known about that either. Could we see something in gravitational waves? And then perhaps the most exciting is what else is out there that we don't know? When you build big, big new uh, instruments, big new devices, perhaps you see things that you didn't anticipate. So how do you detect gravitational waves? So th this is a cartoon. I'm going to skip the plot on the right in the interest of time. But, but remember, I said that the Earth is a noisy place. So that plot that you see up uh, in the upper left there, that's actually the, the noise, real noise from a gravitational wave. It's a time series, you know, arbitrary units. but. Um, you can think of them as seconds. Um, and that purple curve is a gravitational wave signal, hypothetical in this case, embedded in that um, uh, uh, curve. So if you were just to look, if I were to take the color away, you would not see that gravitational wave. You wouldn't, you know, if the purple weren't there, if it were pink, you wouldn't see it. So let me actually show you how we do the detection. So we basically take a theoretical gravitational waveform, which we know how to calculate, and we cross correlate it. And when it hits the real gravitational wave, this is called match filtering, we, we actually see a signal. So we have hundreds of thousands and right now even millions of those different, we call them templates that represent different masses of neutron stars and black holes that we search through every bit of our detector to detect gravitational waves. So this is a very computationally uh, intensive event. Um, the first gravitational wave, this is something that um, I will certainly remember um, for the rest of my life, uh, was recorded on September 14th, 2015. Um, the waves that you see there, the red one and the blue one in the lower plot are actual waveforms that were recorded by uh, the, in the red case, the Hanford detector, in the blue case, the Livingston detector, uh, on the morning at the time when we detected the gravitational waves. Um, a remarkable event, there's actually a tremendous amount of physical information contained in those waves. You know, you can find the masses, you can find how far away the waveforms are. You can, you can sense something about whether the, the individual black holes are actually spinning themselves. But we were able to take that data after we detected uh, that, and we were, we were actually, um, my colleague Kip Thorne and uh, uh, Saul Tikalski and their students actually were able to use general relativity to make a visual simulation of what we saw. 
Well, what produced these gravitational waves was two black holes, one about 36 times the mass of the sun, the other about 30 times the mass of the sun. And they were about uh, 100, I don't know, 1.3 billion light years away. And so the movie that I'm gonna show is actually the, a general relativistic visualization of the source of, of these gravitational waves. And I'll tell you that I'll, I've sped it up by about a factor of 100, or they have, the simulators. Uh, and what you see is these two gravitational waves going around. The background are basically stars for your frame of reference. The reason the stars are bending is because light is bending. Eventually this thing, the, these two black holes collide and what's left is a big massive black hole. Uh, that whole event that I just showed you took about in real, in real time, about two tenths of a second. During that time, about three solar masses of energy was converted from the black hole into gravitational. So, so this event, if you think about it in terms of luminosity, uh, was a, a very bright event, three, three times the mass of the sun was radiated away in that 0.2 seconds. Um, coming back to the uh, point I made earlier about sound, if you play the signal just from the detector, you filter it a little bit, you hear that thump, 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 I'll play it again. So that little thump, 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 I played it three times, there's only one actual recording of it, is the gravitational wave signal so it's really amazing to think about the fact that these gravitational, these black holes, 1.3 billion light years away, they were moving at about six times, 60% uh, of the speed of light when they collided. You know, the masses are you know, 30 times the mass of the sun, produce this little blip that goes boop in our, in our signal. So that you know, sort of gives you a sense of, of, of how, at least for me, how, how uh, really cool this, this astronomy is. So, so let me, in the last couple of minutes I have, talk about the, the other way we do gravitational wave astronomy, and that's that we partner with our uh, friends and colleagues in the uh, sort of electromagnetic astronomy community. So, so this idea that two binary neutron stars can collide, uh, they produce gravitational waves. Uh, they also produce visual and infrared light. They produce radio waves, radio, they produce cosmic rays, neutrinos, x-rays. Basically they radiate across the electromagnetic spectrum. They radiate, uh, gravitational waves, and, and, and if you can see all of those things together, um, you get a really good picture, a really complete picture of, of what happens when two neutron stars collide. And I should point out that uh, you might think these are rare events. Uh, it turns out that most stars in our galaxy, indeed in the universe, actually form in binary systems. Uh, those stars evolve through their life cycles, uh, depending on how massive the stars are. Some of them will just die away as white dwarfs. Some of them will, will go supernova and become uh, neutron stars. Again, the mass is about 1.4, 1.5 times the mass of the sun. The more massive ones will become uh, uh, black holes. And so, so these things are actually pretty ubiquitous. Just measuring them is, is, quite, is quite challenging. So, um, so to do what we call GW astronomy or multi-messenger astronomy, it's all about as they say in real estate, location, location, location. A single observatory, the one in Livingston, the one in Hanford, we also partner with one in Virga and uh, Louisiana, is insensitive to sky location. You can't tell where the signal came from. And that's because you don't have enough information. All you have is a waveform. But if you have a point source, like two neutron stars that are radiating gravitational waves, and you have at least three detectors, um, there's a subtlety which you can ask about if you're interested. Um, by measuring the arrival time, the difference in arrival time between uh, the signal at Hanford and Livingston, in this case in Italy, um, that gives you not great, but good information about the local, the, where this event may have come from. And so the next big event, I mean, we, we, we detected a number of black hole mergers. Uh, after we discovered the first one. But the next big event actually happened in 2017. This is just a picture of the network. Uh, the one, the, 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 the data I'm gonna talk about is uh, by those three uh, gravitational wave network uh, or observatories. So, um, so the, the, the event that we saw in August, this was uh, co discovered uh, the 8th of, uh, I'm sorry, the 17th of August in, in 2017. Uh, we recorded a signal, and again, I'll point you to the lower right. That's a different way of looking at our signals. That's a, we call it a spectrogram or a time frequency plot. Uh, it plots 
time on the x-axis, frequency on the y-axis. And that track that you see going through there is actually the, the gravitational wave signal. All right, at the time or soon after uh, that signal came through our detector, it was also discovered completely independently uh, in a different uh, um, sector, in this case, gamma rays and X-rays by the Fermi gamma ray burst monitor uh, detector and also by the uh, uh, integral um, uh, satellite detector. So these are satellites in space. Fermi is operated by NASA, integral by uh, ESA. These events at, at the time were in, discovered independently. It turns out that they are actually highly correlated and they come from the same event. And the event is the collision of two neutron stars. So let me see if I can get this video going for you. Um, I don't know if you heard it. I, I certainly did. As they were getting close to one another, the closer they got, you started to hear a pitch, you know, a sort of a, a frequency pitch come up and then it went whoop. All right. And that about the time they collided. And at the time they collided, because these neutron stars are made of neutrons, they have matter in them, the collisions are spectacular and they produce these bursts of jets of gamma rays, jets of particles that come out. And so this, this single event um, produced both gamma rays and gravitational waves at the same time. Turns out it not only produced gamma rays and gravitational waves, as I said, it produced everything. It produced radio waves, optical waves. So we made an announcement. Actually, it took us about three hours in LIGO to discover, in Virgo to discover this. The gamma ray people have discovered it pretty quickly. All right, we, we both put out what are known as astronomical alerts, basically saying, hey, we have seen this event. And in our case, we had a location for it, as I'll show you. And the gamma ray burst people put out their uh, alert saying, hey, we saw a correlated event at the same time. And that really lit the astronomical uh, uh, community on fire. And I believe about 75 major telescopes, as well as seven or eight satellites, uh, uh, actually went and tried to find this uh, event. And, and this picture here just shows you the, the little green bananas are the things you should be focusing on. The smallest one is the error box. In other words, it's the, it's the location, 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 where we uh, sort of pin down where this event might have come from. All right, now that's astronomically speaking, not very good, but it's good enough for the astronomers to start going out and looking at different parts of that place. And so that's what they did. And, and we're gonna zoom in. And what they found there, there are about 50 galaxies uh, that are pretty close uh, there. And they eventually, zoomed in on this galaxy. This is in uh, uh, CG for, uh, NGC 4993. Uh, and it was identified as the source of the optical signal that accompanied the gamma ray burst and the gravitational wave signal. And the, the uh, actual spectrum, this object that's in circle there is the kilonova. It is the, it's the, res, the remnant behind the two neutron stars that have collided. And right now it's blue. It actually takes about a few days to actually turn red, infrared, and then it sort of just, you know, dims out and, and goes away. Uh, so all told, I think about 25 telescopes actually found this and looked at it, including the Hubble telescope. Uh, 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 so it was really a, a very coordinated, it was probably one of the most coordinated astronomical uh, observations in, in the history of astronomy. Um, and without showing any of the data, I want to come back to this uh, uh, point that I made about nucleosynthesis. So it had been speculated, there have been theories that, that suggest that the elements that come in the, the lanthanide series, so the heavier elements, uh, the ones down you know, above sort of 40, 45 uh, atomic number are produced in the collisions of, of neutron stars. Uh, that was never known because we'd never actually observed one happening in real time. This event changed all that. And with that observation, you were able to actually extract uh, by looking at the optical spectra, um, uh, the, this, this process of 
what's known as R process, rapid neutron capture nucleosynthesis. And it worked great. It worked exactly with the theory. So, so we can now say with confidence that a lot of the heavy elements, uh, for example, the gold that you might have, uh, uranium, platinum, uh, are produced in these uh, binary neutron star uh, uh, collisions. And so that was quite, that was quite exciting. Um, I'm going to wrap up um, uh, with two, two more things. So first of all, we've been operating since 2015. We don't operate all the time. Uh, we actually are in a down period. Fortunately, unfortunately, COVID has made us, uh, it's taken a little longer than we had expected to get back online, but we're in the process of upgrading our detector. Uh, the reason we do that is the more sensitive it is, the, the, the more of these events we kind of see. So since we've actually been operating, we've had three observing runs uh, since 2015. We've seen a total of 90 gravitational wave events. And in this plot, we call it the Eagle plot sort of captures, um, you know, in number, what, what kinds of event we've seen. So all those cyan uh, curves are, are basically black holes that we have discovered. Uh, if you go up on the plot, those are the more massive, the higher you go, the more massive the black holes uh, that we've seen. The, the guys in orange, uh, our neutron star collisions that we've seen. The guys that are hybrid, orange or cyan, we don't know what they are. They could be neutron stars, they could be black holes. So there's lots of interesting questions there. And just for perspective, um, the red and the, uh, the, red and the uh, uh, yellow that you see sort of outlining the, the eagle at the bottom are neutron star collisions in the case of the yellow black hole, uh, uh, black holes in the case of uh, um, the red that have been discovered through electromagnetic astronomy or radio astronomy. So, so we've really done, you know, in just a few short years, we've, we've learned a lot more about, for example, how many binary black hole systems are out there in the universe, what's their mass. Uh, there's still a lot more work to be done here, but it's, it's really quite, um, quite exciting. And, and, and that's where I'll wrap up because um, now that we know that this field actually, you know, can produce great scientific results, we're thinking about what comes next. And, 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 in, and there are two sort of very new, very big detectors that are on the, the sort of the drawing board. Uh, we call them third generation gravitational wave observatory. So, so they basically, the, the one that I'm involved in is the, the one in the US, it's called Cosmic Explorer. Uh, it basically takes the concept of LIGO that I showed you earlier and just ups it by a factor of 10. So in this case, instead of having four kilometer arms, we have 40 kilometer arms. Sensitivity scales with the length of the arms, more sensitive. Uh, in uh, Europe, they're building a, a really sophisticated uh, design underground called the Einstein telescope. Uh, it has 10 kilometer arms. Both of these detectors, once they get operational, and it will be 15 years, it'll probably be the mid to late thirties before they're operating. Um, we'll be able to basically probe the entire star forming universe. So, so they can look back so far in time or so far in redshift in, in astronomical terms that you can actually see black holes from that were born very early in the universe, neutron stars that were born very early in the universe. So, so we'll be able to do a tremendous amount of, of gravitational wave uh, astrophysics with, with these new uh, devices. Um, sort of in coordination, with all of this, there are uh, other observatories that look for gravitational waves that are not exactly like LIGO and Virgo uh, because gravitational waves come in a spectrum just like electromagnetic waves. Um, turns out uh, you build different detectors to look for different regions of those spectrums. Uh, the ground-based detectors that I've talked about are the sort of the, 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 the highest frequency events that you probably would see from an astrophysical perspective. So I call them the gamma rays of gravitational waves. Uh, but you go a little bit lower and you can see sort of massive black holes colliding or even supermassive black holes colliding. Uh, and you can measure some of that using space-based detectors. There's a, a project called LISA, Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, that's gonna go up in the next decade. Uh, there's also pulsar uh, timing. That picture is of the Arecibo, which unfortunately is no longer in operation but there are other telescopes that can actually measure the arrival time of radio pulses and, and the information about the nature of black hole, uh, the nature of gravitation waves at lower frequency, nanohertz frequencies sits there. And then even the Big Bang itself actually, we believe produced gravitational waves. So we look and use gravitational waves to probe right back to the beginning of the universe. So, so, so 
sort of take it as a whole, this is just sort of, we think the beginning, or I think the beginning of, of gravitational astronomy. And I think the, the future is really quite, uh, quite bright. So I'll stop there. Uh, for more information, a couple of websites you can, uh, um, you can go to. Uh, and I have to gratefully acknowledge the National Science Foundation who has faithfully um, supported us uh, for the last 40 years, uh, as well as my institution, Caltech, our partners at MIT, and also uh, the much broader LIGO Largo collaboration. So I'll stop there and I'll be happy to take questions. Great. Um, so I will just read out some of the questions that were submitted through the Q&A portion of the Zoom call. Um, so one question, let's see. All right, so here's a question. How can we specifically target different astronomical objects with LIGO? Is it similar to other telescopes where we can point it at certain parts of the sky or would it be set to direct, or would it be set to detect of signals from certain types of black holes? Right, so, so yeah, this comes, back to the, the reason why we have multiple detectors that all sort of operate at one. So the, the analogy that I can give is uh, a, an interferometer is kind of like a microphone. No matter what direction the, the, the gravitational wave is coming in, like a microphone, no matter what direction this, the sound is coming from, it's gonna get amplified or detected. All right, so that's why we need multiple gravitational wave, uh, wave detectors. And in fact, it turns out the more you have, uh, the, the, the more your accuracy is in, in detecting gravitational waves. We're, we will never be as good as even the worst optical telescopes. You know, they're, you know the, the precision with which an optical telescope can measure, resolve a, you know, an object in the sky is measured in you know, arc seconds. Um, ours are measured in tens of degrees, maybe a few degrees, depending on, um, you know, lots of things, um, which I won't go into. So, so we're, we're very poor at that, but, but by having more of these detectors, we can move more. Um, in terms of what kinds of signals that we can see, yes. Um, so our detector is wide band, but, you know, many, many spans, many kilohertz. Uh, the, the signals themselves actually have, uh, uh, a multi-band characteristic to them. In other words, as these gravitational waves uh, are generated, uh, you know, the orbits are decaying, the, the, the objects speed up, and that actually changes the frequency of the gra gravitational wave. So it actually goes up as you get, you know, closer and closer to the merger. So, so we see actually see broadband signals. There are other kinds of sources. Um, for example, an isolated neutron star. There are reasons to believe that we could uh, see gravitational waves from isolated neutron stars. They would produce a very different kind of signal. Uh, and we would know that because it would be a very mono, monochromatic signal or you know, monofrequency signal. So by looking at the nature of the signal, we can tell what we're, what we're, what we're looking at. Great. Um, okay. Next question is, it was similar to what you were talking about with extending the arm length, but it's I guess more getting into that. Um, what if we increase the arm lengths from four kilometers to more than that? How precise um, will it get to detect gravitational waves? I guess it's like the degree of sensitivity increase. Right, right. So great question. Uh, uh, so sort of, I would say the first order. So sort of, you know, if you think about nothing else, um, you, you increase the arm length by a factor of two or a factor of five or a factor of 10, you increase the ten sensitivity by a factor of two or five or 10. Uh, it's more complicated than that because some of the noises that I showed in that complicated plot in the middle of the talk, uh, don't scale the same way as you know, that simple factor of you know, two or five or 10. Um, some get better, some get worse. Uh, so you have to actually do a little more. It's not just straightforward to make the detectors much more, much longer. And there are more complications um, and, and, and they have to do with just, you know, simple things like, you know, construction. So if, if you, you know, the earth is, we don't notice it, but the earth actually is curved, right? And if you ask yourself, if I have two points that are separated on the earth by 40 kilometers, um, what's the arc and what's the, what's the, the, the distance between just basically a straight line connecting those two points 
and the arc that comes from the curvature of the earth? And the answer is if you go to the center, 20 kilometers midpoint, uh, there's about 30 meters of, of distance, of height difference there. So you actually have to do a lot of earth moving. You have to actually dig, <laughs> you know, get a, you have to basically make a trench that's, you know, 40 kilometers wide. You can be more clever about it, and we're trying to do that, but you can look for places where the curvature goes in the opposite direction. Um, but you have to worry about that. The other thing that is more subtle, but is a problem, is that uh, the mirrors themselves, as I said, are hanging, all right? And they're hanging um, with respect to the Earth's gravitational wave. Uh, our gravitational pool or the or gravitational field. So as I go further and further away, the, 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 the mirrors are no longer like this, but they're actually starting to open up because the angle opens up. And, and that has actually consequences that have to do with the noise. So there's, there's you know, a lot of thinking that needs to go in. You, it, you know, to first order, you can say, yeah, we'll make it longer. Second order, you have to do a little bit more. And then the other, the ultimate thing that always ends up limiting at some point is, you know, how much money can you, you know, get to, to actually build these uh, big detectors and vacuum systems. So, so lots of lots of things in that, that you know, seemingly simple questions actually got a lot of complexity to it. Okay, um, next question is, how does a different power laser used in LIGO change the instrument? Right, so, um, you know, let me go back and again. All right, yeah, let's look at this plot. Um, so the two dominant noise sources that are due to laser power are what I call photon pressure at low frequencies um, below, say, 50 or 60 hertz, and uh, photon arrival time differences at high frequencies. Uh, it turns out they work against each other. Um, if I want to turn, I can turn up the laser power and it turns up by turning up the laser power, uh, I actually, the, the, the signal to noise, the signal that's recorded by the gravitational wave to the noise that had, comes from the photon arrival times uh, actually goes favorably as you go to higher power because it's the square root of the power. So if I increase the power by a factor of four, I would increase, I would drop that noise curve by a factor of two on this plot. Unfortunately, that has the bad consequence of increasing the photon pressure by a factor of two, actually maybe even four. Yeah, it increases by a factor of four. So, so there's sort of a, a sweet spot that has to do with how massive your mirror is. So if I have more photon, if I turn the laser power up because I want better shot noise, that's the high, excuse me, the high frequency performance. Um, I sacrifice some low frequency performance, the photon, that curve goes, photon pressure uh, curve goes up on the graph, but I can make a heavier mirror, all right? And maybe, you know, the heavier mirror is more resistant to the photon pressure. It turns out, uh, so, so the simple answer is that we operate at about 150 watts because we think that's the sweet spot. Actually, we're all, we also have other problems with laser power that I didn't go into. The laser power is absorbed, even though it's not, uh, you know, not much of it absorbed. So there are thermal effects in the uh, uh, instrument that we worry about. We, we've come up with a, a, a sort of a clever trick that's based on something called the Heisenberg uncertainty uh, relation that we can actually um, change, alter the characteristic of low light. You know, we have a, you know, a buzzword for it. We call it quantum engineering, the, the light field. But, but that, that basically can actually both improve the sensitivity to high frequency by decreasing the random fluctuations from the photon arrival time, and also uh, it, it decrease the fluctuations from photon pressure just by a sort of a, a, a not so simple optical trick. So we can actually do a little bit better than both. But but the simple answer is 100 watts, 150 watts is about the what we can put into these interferometers now without actually causing serious serious problems. Okay, um, I think we have time for a few more questions, 8.58 right now. Um, okay, next question. Uh, you had mentioned space-based interferometers earlier. Uh, this question asks, 
is a space-based interferometer feasible? And I guess that means whether physically, financially, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, so um, the idea of putting an interferometer in space goes back probably 30, 35 years. And um, a, a part of the gravitational wave community has been working very actively on designing this concept called LISA. Um, back and show you that picture we get to it. There we go. So I don't know if you can see my pointer here. I can find it myself. Oops. There we go. Oh, sorry. There. So so this uh, picture right here is actually an art. It's it's not exactly how Lisa is going to be built. Uh, but the, the concept is very mature. Uh, the idea is that you send three different satellites in space. So it, this doesn't look like the interferometer, the L-shaped interferometer that I showed you. It's actually uh, three interferometers in one. Each um, satellite uh, is both a, a transmitter of laser light and a receiver. Uh, and the arms in this case are not four kilometers. They're 250 million kilometers. No, yeah, 200, no, 2.5 million kilometers. Sorry, I get my distances wrong sometimes. So, so these, uh, so they're very far apart. Um, and they actually um, are not orbiting the Earth. They're actually in a solar orbit trailing the Earth. Um, the, the technology for this has been demonstrated. There's actually been a mission that was uh, very successful about five years ago showing that you could launch one of these. Uh, satellites and make the precision, the kind of measurement with the precision needed to be able to detect these lower frequency gravitational waves. So um, the name of the game now is to mature the design. Uh, the uh, the um, European Space Agency has already funded this and said that it will launch, they call it one of their large class missions, it will launch, I think right now in 2036 is the date that I remember hearing recently. Uh, NASA is getting involved uh, in some of this. There's a lot of technology development that needs to be done. You know, doing things in space is you know, hundreds of times more complicated than doing on Earth, because in this case, you can't fix it uh, if something goes broken. So, so there's a, a lot of work to be done. As far as the costs, because I heard that mentioned, I think right now it's, oh, I want to say somewhere between two and three billion euros, but I don't remember uh, exactly. So. But yes, it is. We we believe it is very feasible. Okay. Um, next question is a little more outside this talk, but it's I think it's still a good question. Um, what advice would you give to someone in their undergraduate astronomy and physics degree who's interested in gravitational wave research? Um, yeah, no, it's a good good question. I guess um, a couple. I recommend a couple of things. Uh, first of all, there are lots of gravitational wave groups in the world now. Um, within the LIGO Scientific Collaboration, there's a hundred of them, uh, including in Canada. I don't think Toronto has one, but um, I know UBC has one. And I think there's one other um, university up there that has one. Uh, so first do some research and look, look you know, to see if uh, what, what you're interested in. And gravitational wave, you know, astronomy comes in many different flavors. You know, I, I'm, I happen to be a detector person. You know, I, you know, when I started in this, I started working on the laser and the, some of the optics for the detector. Um, but there's also the people that actually look for the gravitational wave signals. That's, you know, computationally very heavy. There's people that, uh, you know, think, think about the astrophysics and interpret them. So um, there are lots of different aspects to it. So there's lots of different opportunities. Uh, the second thing I would say is um, a lot of uh, universities, including, for example, Caltech, uh, have undergraduate research um, programs for summer students where you can apply. They're competitive, uh, but you can apply. And if you get in, you'll come to Caltech or sometimes we have students go to the observatories uh, and do a project for um, uh, a, you know, a summer. Uh, and it's a meaningful project. It's, you know, it's um, often these projects get published as you know in, in, in the 
peer reviewed literature. Uh, and a number of people that, that I actually know in the field, including a, a former student of mine, got started through um, one of these undergraduate research uh, programs. Uh, so, so I would I would go online and do a lot of research um, about you know are, are there programs that you might be interested in there. And th if you're going you want to go to graduate school, of course, look at the programs. Um, you know that look at the schools that have good programs and um, gravitational. Uh, physics and astronomy, um, and you know, reach out to people there. I guess that's the that's probably the best advice I could give. Um, how are we doing on time uh, in terms of? Because I have two more questions open, but if, if I'm, I'm fine, I'm great. Okay, just didn't know what Okay. Um, the next question is, seeing how the topic of gravitational wave detection is a relatively new subfield of astronomy, what are some pros and cons of working in this rapidly emerging field? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so uh, let, me, let, me, let me start by um, expanding that question a little bit to say that, that gravitational wave astronomy is part of it. We, a lot of the work is also physics related, right? We do a lot of physics, but, but let, let, let's speak about the astronomy. Um, are one of the, okay, uh, what are the pros? Uh, the pros are it's a, you know, the field is, you know, just getting started. We've had a lot of, you know, you know really uh, fun, fun results and discoveries over the past five years, but there's still a, a tremendous amount of discovery space, um, you know, unexplored uh, space that will get explored over the next you know, 20, 30, 40 years. These new detectors coming up in the, you know, in the late 30s, um, the space-based ones, the ground-based ones are uh, surely going to uh, deliver more um, compelling science. Uh, so, so, and, and again, there's, this, there, there's so many opportunities to do uh, uh, different kinds of, of sort of sub science in gravitational waves. Like I say, you can be a laser physicist, you can uh, be a numeric, you can do numerical general relativity, you can be a, you can work on machine learning. Um, you know, there are different, there are really, really many different domains uh, here. A lot of, a lot of what we do, we, we, uh, the engineers that work with LIGO are, are super and uh, uh, we owe a lot of the success of LIGO to, to the engineers who work there. Um, so that I, I think those are pros. One, there's lots of opportunities and lots of different subdisciplines that one can get involved in. Uh, what are the cons? Um, one con is that uh, it these it's a, both a pro and a con. Um, the 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 um, detectors are organized, or, or the, the the detectors um, work through collaborations. All right, so the, the LIGO scientific collaboration, which I'm a member of, has I think now about 1,400 people. Uh, Virgo, the other detector I talked about, they have about 700 people, and there are other detectors that are coming up. So these are sort of this is big science, uh, and 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 as a consequence, um, you know, there's a lot of different parts of it that you never see if you're working in you know one particular field of it, um, and sort of getting getting noticed in a, you know, crowds like that can be, uh, can be somewhat, somewhat challenging. I mean, I, you know, there are many examples of success of students who started as, you know, either undergraduates or graduates in the gravitational wave uh, uh, collaborations and, you know, are now, you know, full professors and won prizes and things like that. Uh, so, so there are opportunities, but it is, it, it, you are working in a kind of a, a different in, environment and it's a more structured environment, I'll say it that way. Uh, on the other hand, our data is public. Um, it's not public immediately, but you can download the data from all of our runs, uh, and you can look for gravitational wave signals yourself. Um, and we actually have schools uh, that we run twice a year, no, once a year, excuse me, that that you know train students and things like that. So you can actually do very good gravitational wave science without actually being part of the collaboration. So. So I, you know, I would say on balance, you know, there's many more pros than than cons. But you know, like anything, you've got to you've got to look at the whole the whole picture. Great. Um, okay, and the at least the finalistic question here um, is that: Is there something fundamentally different about how gravitational waves look in the detectors, i.e., LIGO, that helps distinguish detection events from background noise? Yeah, exactly. That's that. So the the 
the signals that we look for, at least many of the signals that we look for, we know them in advance. So we start with the belief in general relativity, uh, you know, that, that, you know, objects who are orbiting around one another obey, you know, general relativity. That allows us, and it turns out there's, you know, lots of, 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 of work over, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, maybe even longer, that, ha you know, is very theoretical, that actually allows one to calculate what these waveforms should actually look like theoretically. So, so we start from that, and then we basically say, okay, you know, each waveform will look, they're, they're all what we call self-similar um, in the sense that the waveforms basically have the same qualitative characteristics. The frequencies will change if you change the masses, uh, the phase, you know, but, but the phase relationship sort of re uh, remains, this, remains the same. So you can then use basically, you know, interpolation, computing, computers and things like that to generate hundreds of thousands of, of these different waveforms for different kinds of black holes or neutron stars. And, and, and we do this thing called match filtering. Um, so these waveforms that are computer generated, we call them templates. And we sift through the data using something called cross correlation. I, I showed it in an earlier slide, I won't go back to it. But basically we, we take the real data uh, and we time slide, we basically take the, the wave, the template waveform and we do a mathematical operation called a cross correlation, which as a function of time where we time slide the, the uh, templated signal against the, the real detector data stream. And when there is a weak signal or even a strong signal embedded in the waveform, as the as as the 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 time delay between the template and the real signal goes to zero, in other words, they perfectly overlap, you get a huge spike. All right. And and that tells you that you've got a real signal. Now you need to see that in both interferometers. So if you only see the one and not the other, you you can't do it. You 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 can't you call that a gravitational wave. Um, um, there's also other we actually have a way of doing backgrounds, which I won't go into, but, but you can assign a, uh, something called a, 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 a false alarm rate. We can't, you know, we make probabilistic detection statements. We basically say that this, this event has a false alarm rate of one in a million years or one in two million years, things like that. So there are lots of different, very understood, very tried and true uh, methods used based on match filtering, based on statistical uh, uh, analysis of, of background events that allow you to make um, uh, uh, the, the detections. Um, but for it becomes more complicated for signals that we don't understand. Remember, I showed a picture of a question mark. If we get a weird signal, we can't use templates because we don't have templates. So then it becomes a little more complicated to actually you know, understand what we're seeing. There has to be coincidence. Uh, we have to know that the detector was not producing any spurious uh, uh, noises internally, uh, but it becomes more, more complicated. That's the last of the list of questions. Um, I had a short question of my own, actually. Um, I think back in one of the images you showed, it was of the LIGO detector, and basically you set the lengths of the arms, the difference, such that you get, like, I, I think it was a destructive interference pattern towards the end, and you look for deviations from that to detect gravitational right. waves. Um, was there a particular reason why, like the length of the arms, weren't set to be so that it was constructively interferent? Well, we, we, yeah, we want the the detectors. We want as little light to be hitting the um, the output photo detector. That was that sort of black square that I showed in the movie as possible, because any light that's hitting the detector that's not from gravitational waves uh, is noise. All right, and it turns out there is some light hitting the detector. It has to do with, you know, some some of the fact that the optics isn't perfect, and things like that. But you want you want to minimize the amount of light hitting the detector because uh, there's it produces, you know, uh, excess noise in the electronics and things like that. So you uh, so you set the arm lengths so that you 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 don't operate. Actually, this is a subtlety, but. We don't operate exactly on what we call a dark fringe. In other words, completely right at the, you know, right in the the, the well of that uh, interference pattern. We actually shift the the mirror off a bit. Actually, in terms of physical numbers, it's interesting to contemplate. We, you know, we calibrate these detectors exquisitely, so we can move a mirror 
by one picometer, <laughs> right? one, you know, a, a, a trillionth of a meter. So we, we actually offset one arm relative to the other by about 15 picometers. And that lets a little bit of light into the, uh, uh, into the photodiode, not enough to compromise the noise. But what it does do is when the gravitational wave pattern comes, it modulates the, the signal so-called linearly instead of quadratically, which you would get on a dark fridge. So, so you know, short sort of a, to wrap up, we're not completely dark, but there are reasons that you want to be as dark as possible for basically noise, noise performance. Let's see, okay. Um, okay, so if there's no more questions, um, I'd like to thank Dr. Wrightsey for coming and giving a phenomenal talk uh, today. Um, it's the events tomorrow, we have, I believe at 6.30, we have an astrophotography workshop given by Kat, Katarina Isabel-Bedaminas, there's the schedule. Um, and at eight o'clock, sorry, that's at eight o'clock. And at 6.30, we have the ethics panel um, with Professor Dr. Uh, Jessica Dempsey, Dr. Robert McLaren, Dr. Heidi Nelson, and Dr. Shed Pete. And then weather permitting, we'll have an online observation time through our local observatory. Okay. Um, leave that with me all. So again, thank you much for coming. That was a phenomenal talk. Both of our talks were exceptional. Um, thank you again for coming out, giving your time. Um, sorry, all right. I forgot to come up. Thank you all. Thank you, audience. For uh, thanks to the audience for coming out. Um, we hope to see you tomorrow and on Saturday. Um, and obviously, thank you to the organizers and to other fellow ASX executives coming out. Um, again, don't forget there is a raffle. Um, I think earlier in the chat, Julie, who is now gone, uh, link gave a link where you can purchase raffle tickets. Um, but again, obviously any ticket you bought for this event is good through the other two events. So if you're already registered, you can come to any future events tomorrow through Saturday. Great. Thank you very much, everyone.